Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to TVMCon. My name is Sean Silva. I work at Google uh, as part of a team called Erie, which is developing a MLIR-based uh, compiler and runtime for machine learning. As part of that, we found that we've needed a PyTorch front end, which led us to starting the Torch MLIR project. So let's jump right in. This parts of this talk are taken from a full technical talk that was given at the MLIR open design meeting. Uh, you can find that on the, the links here, but I've tried to tailor it for this audience. So no need to, to look at that if you don't want to. So who are the URI team at Google? Um, well, we're building this, a machine learning compiler and runtime based on MLIR, like I was saying. Um, I'm not gonna go into any details about that, but there's quite a bit you can find about that online. Uh, we just needed a PyTorch front end for uh, Erie. And so we found, we thought, well, why don't we start one? So we, while we started it for our own needs, we found that, you know, basically everybody who has an MLIR based machine learning compiler also needs a PyTorch front end. So there's no reason to pigeonhole this to, to Erie. And so why not make it a community project? So right now we have two full-time engineers, myself and Yi, who are working on, on uh, Torch MLIR at Google, along with a, uh, a very quickly growing community, which I'll talk about in a second. So at a high level, what is Torch MLIR? So it's the confluence of two large ecosystems, you know, two of my beloved frameworks, PyTorch being one and MLIR being another one. And, you know, there's a desire to have these two interoperate since a lot of really cool stuff is being done on, on each side. So going a level deeper, Torch MLIR is fundamentally a community open source effort. And it, we're trying to centralize all of the PyTorch and MLIR interop paths into a single project. So there's a lot of uh, closed source uh, solutions or kind of one-off solutions in this space, but we try to do to, to make something that's gonna stand the test of time. And really what we try to do is we're pretty narrowly focused on trying to normalize PyTorch into a sort of principled IR that we implement using it, the MLIR framework. And that solves the most common issues that backend integrators have. And that lets them focus on their unique value. So in terms of positioning, the project is an LLVM incubator project. So that's nice because it gives us the LLVM foundations governance uh, structure. And we're dual licensed, which lets us move code either into, into other parts of the MLIR ecosystem or LLVM or into PyTorch as makes sense because we actually act, are actively interact, you know, we're at the, at the nexus of both of those. We're on GitHub, you can find us in the LLVM organization. We have a Discord channel that's pretty active and we have about monthly uh, community meetings. So what was the need that sort of drove us to making this a much wider thing than just Erie? So, Industry partners were telling us that they've seen like literally five different PyTorch to MLIR front ends. And, you know, none of them really was designed in such a way or positioned in such a way that it could just become an off the shelf building block for the entire ecosystem. And we really want that to happen because we want to let, you know, people on both sides, either on PyTorch or on MLIR to focus on what's what differentiates their, their value without needing to you know, worry about you know, what's happening on the other side. Uh, when we posted our initial announcement about two months ago uh, on the PyTorch forums, 10 vendors expressed support. We're still the top uh, post of this quarter. And we found that, and we're trying to just provide like the essential building blocks that everybody needs. So the community, this is, uh, like I said, it's only been about two months since we announced announced Torch MLIR on the PyTorch forums. Uh, we went from about two committers uh, before that up to 16 committers in those two months. Um, and that's really been really exciting and we were, we've been growing really fast. ARM has already um, you know, committed and is building out um, support for their TOSA um, you know, ML operator spec uh, as a backend. And we, our first community meeting was a big success. We had big name tech companies, Dell startups, PhD students, the kind of just everything you can imagine there. And I've been, you know, receiving offline emails uh, with respect to, uh, you know, various other, you know, big names 
as well that are really interested in contributing or using this software. Uh, we've been working really closely with the PyTorch de devs and influencing their roadmap. With, um, Lazy Tensor Core is one of the main ones, but we're also uh, working closely with people who are working on um, better exposing or making rationalizing shape functions or opti compositions, all these common needs in the ecosystem. And we're really plugging into that discussion because ultimately, if something can be done best inside of PyTorch proper, or there can be a source of truth in there, that's what we want. We don't want to be developing our own code that is just duplicating things that the whole, like, like not even just Torch MLIR, but like the entire PyTorch community needs. So what works? Um, ResNet inference is working. BERT inference is almost working. Uh, we have a ResNet training and BERT training coming down the pipe, and I, received you know, offline emails or have issues that are um, for different models that people have, have interest in. And so um, by all means, uh, if you can find, go onto our issue tracker, feel free to file, file a bug for a, a model that you'd like to support. Um, give, it, give us, uh, maybe even try out the code, try compiling it. We're very open and, look, and looking to see you know, who, who really wants to engage and, you know, and, and, and work with us as we bring up this project. So really what we'd like in the future uh, is to have you know, hugging face, torch vision, et cetera, just work out, completely out of the box. Um, and we want training and inference support. Uh, we want vendors to be as easy as possible to integrate into torch MLIR. So it's just a matter of plugging into uh, some sort of uh, compatibility test suite that we have and bringing up ops one by one, making it really easy for vendors to clarify what, you know, what level of support they have without needing to get into the, you know, get into the weeds on, the, on you know, touching all the way up to PyTorch. We can kind of filter that and provide a more normalized, um, you know, be, a, be kind of a proxy for, the, for, for that. We also really want to make it easy for people to experiment with custom functionality. So whether that's sparsity, quantization, distribution, all sorts of you know things you can imagine uh, there. We want to make that really, really easy. So just as a quick diagram, so kind of inside of PyTorch, there's actually multiple sort of front ends that where your PyTorch program can be converted into an IR. The two main ones are TorchScript and Lazy Tensor Core. I'm sure there are going to be other ones coming down the pike. Um, and so those both get imported into Torch MLIR into, um, in, into a, like a common IR that is able to represent them. And then we do, we can, we do various um, things to normalize and make that IR uh, more standardized and cleaner and easier to analyze. And then we, can then feed that, that into various backends. So Linog on tensors, if you're familiar with that from the MLIR ecosystem, TOSA, which I mentioned is a community-driven spec from ARM for ML operators. Uh, MHLO is a uh, the the XLA the MLIR-based XLA representation, uh, and uh, you know maybe someday we can have relay there as a as a connection point. So talking about a, the Torch MLIR dialect, for those not familiar, MLIR is uh, a framework that's built around these dialects, which is a, a basically just a set of ops and types. And so uh, one of the cool things about MLIR is you can have multiple dialects coexisting. And in this case, I'm only talking about the Torch dialect. And so the really cool thing about this dialect is basically we can auto-generate it entirely from Torch's op registry. And they have so much information in there that we can generate all of the, basically all the semantically load-bearing aspects of our uh, program of our IR directly. Um, there's only a few hand defined things that we need for some advanced features of TorchScript, but it's really cool because we can have these custom types. We can model the difference between like a, a mutable tensor and a, a value semantic tensor. We can model unknown uh, element types, un un unknown shapes, um, various like lists, dictionaries, things that arise in more complex types of uh, programs that are deployed and even class types. Here's a quick example. I'm not gonna go into detail here, but we extract some information from the Torch registry. This is our dump on the left. And then we can uh, convert that into a, the, what's called ODS, which is a, um, basically a 
uh, a domain specific language that is used to generate the um, MLIR uh, dialects. And so in this case, for example, we're able to infer that this op has value semantics. So there's really three uh, really main things that Torch MLIR can do for you right now. We reduce the set of um, ops that you have to deal with. So, you know, not having to deal with in-place variants, not having to deal with uh, softmax, NLL loss, things that just decompose into uh, simpler um, building blocks. We try to make the program as much value semantic or purely functional as possible, just because I think kind of as a compiler industry, we've agreed that that's a really good type of representation for um, the ML backends. Um, we also um, do a lot of work to make the shapes and uh, element types as precise as possible because by default, PyTorch programs don't necessarily, um, because they're coming directly from Python, the shapes and D types are can be arbitrarily dynamic. So we try to bound that um, for backends. So uh, Torch MLIR and what's the intersection with TVM? Well, TVM is a, a mature production system that already has like a very large ecosystem of things going on. Torch MLIR is re still really young. Um, it was only announced about two months ago. And at the right time, it's there, it's totally possible for them to interoperate. If there's already an MLIR relay dialect, if such a thing exists, the conversion should be quite uh, straightforward. Um, and it's just a matter of uh, finding the right need for that. Um, there's no technical, uh, uh, reason why that couldn't happen. Uh, just one one cool uh, last thing uh, is I think it's really interesting the way that we would write our TorchScript to MLIR importer. So TorchScript has a really well-defined um, IR and runtime representation, and it only takes us about a thousand lines of code to import the entire representation. And just for, for and so for context, there's thousands of ops that are actually it's an open-ended set of ops actually involved here. But since we're able to systematically model things in a way that's exactly uh, matches the PyTorch semantics, we can do that. It's also really great with TorchScript because we can generate standalone deployable artifacts and uh, stateful models, control flow, some of these things that are very relevant for, for edge deployments. Um, the Torch, we all are also able to model that as well. Um, TorchScript does have a bit of a downside because it it kind of exposes you to the whole uh, program representation, um, but there's also this uh, other system I described called Lazy Tensor, which avoids that um, for the use cases that can tolerate um, you know that different set of trade-offs. And so uh, we have custom types that model all the Python types, you know, lists, dictionaries, ints, etc., which um, we're able to just import directly. And it's actually quite nice. We don't have to do very much bridging at all. So with that, um, any, uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you for, for, for watching. And I look forward to, to hearing from you. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Sean Silva. And you can also find TorchMYR on GitHub. And uh, there we have our contact information and community meetings and everything uh, listed. Thank you. Thanks so much for the talk, Sean. So we've got some questions from people attending TVMCon. A lot of questions on the community. First one being from Matt Welsh. He's asking this being TVMCon, he's curious to know if you have any thoughts on the potential connections between MLIR and TVM or any comparisons between the two for ML model compilation. Yeah, so I think it's important in this context to not to distinguish between MLIR as a sort of meta IR framework as compared to specific dialects of MLIR. And so I think um, the MLIR ecosystem of dialects generally doesn't have a kind of centralized kind of product the way that TVM does and is quite fragmented. And whereas TVM has like a very clear set of kind of high level, um, you know, uh, products that, you know, work end to end. And so really, I, I don't feel like they're entirely comparable just because of the, um, just the, 
kind of very decentralized nature of, of MLIR um, in that in in that aspect or very fragmented nature. Um, and in terms of the interoperation between the two, I think that there's a big potential to to um, have like a relay dialect of uh, in MLIR, which would map very closely to the relay uh, IR that exists in TVM. And that would be like a very easy, like one-to-one -one bridge between the two ecosystems uh, at any, you know, if somebody wanted to implement such a connector. And so I think they're very complementary. And actually, um, I really view Torch MLIR as, it happens to use MLIR because that's like a very convenient um, way to just meta meta program these IRs, but I, I don't see any reason why like a future TVM, um, you know, once Torch MLIR matures, could, uh, future TVM um, PyTorch front end couldn't be based on it. Yeah, thanks for answering the question about interoperability before I even asked. So now I think there's some questions about like some op lowering. So in particular from Masa, there's a question about how do you lower some PyTorch ops that don't map well to Linalg levels of abstraction and he's imagining things like sorting, non-maximum suppression, cumulative sum and binary search in particular. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good question. And so I think um, this kind of comes back to the fragmentation of the MLIR ecosystem. So these problem, the, the representing these ops in a way that they can be tiled in a data parallel way effectively is something that is actually happening uh, throughout the ecosystem. Like one, um, one significant one I'm aware of and closely collaborating with is inside of the URI project. There's sort of like a Linalg extended dialect that is able to support some of these operations, um, but that's not standardized. And so it's not something that we want to depend on in Torch MLIR, but Torch MLIR might be a forcing function to get those to become more, more widely adopted or in a more central part of the MLIR community. So uh, I think the answer is it's in progress and there's solutions to some of them, but that it's kind of a very slow process to really centralize and especially for a project like Torch MLIR that has to tries to have as few dependencies as possible, um, that it like a very scoped set of dependencies to not just sort of grab things randomly from the ecosystem, but really take the time to carefully, um, you know, push the right buttons throughout the ecosystem to, to make these things materialize in a common way. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got a lot of questions, but I'll try to narrow down to the last set of interrelated questions. And we've got some questions on interoperability and standardization, especially with respect to ARM TOSA. So one of the questions from Adam is, what's the state of standardization in MLIR today? And that Erie and TOSA seem like some positive steps towards standardization. What else is happening? And then some other questions are like, are TOSA and MLIR competing? And how does Torch MLIR utilize TOSA. Sorry if that's a lot, but there yeah, are some yeah. very curious people. Yeah, happy to answer that in the last 30 seconds. Um, so basically, um, so again, MLIR itself is sort of like a, a meta framework for defining IRs. And so there's no real, like to say like TOSA is competing with MLIR doesn't make sense. TOSA's main implementation, so TOSA is like an abstract spec, which ARM has done a really good job of keeping sort of as an independent version spec. And it happens to be that um, kind of the predominant compiler infrastructure that implements that spec is implemented using MLIR. And so I, I, I think that there's, a, there's no competition there. Another example of towards standardization would be, for example, like the, um, the MLIR SPEAR-V dialect, which actually, again, SPEAR-V is like a, a, you know, an existing standard and it uses MLIR. MLIR actually has an ability to specify versioning and things like that um, in the dialect definitions. And so you get all that for free, but the standardization is not really part of MLIR. MLIR, MLIR is really just a framework that you can use to implement some existing standard. So there, I think, um, and from that perspective, I wouldn't consider Erie to really be kind of like a standardization. It's like, um, you know, there's no, Erie doesn't have really like a spec or anything like that. It's just sort of accepts the Linux on tensors abstraction, plus a few other miscellaneous things. That's not really, it's, it's nothing like TOSA in that regard. Um, and Linux on tensors is also not like TOSA in that regard. Um, yeah. So I hope that that provides a little bit of clarity. Like the standardization is really, uh, 
dimension independent of MLIR per se. Yeah, absolutely. That provides a lot of clarity. So I just wanted to thank everyone for asking so many questions here. Sean can answer the remaining questions in the chat. And we'd also suggest that you visit Google's lounge if you'd like to chat more with Google.